Chers étudiants, chers étudiants, students, chers collègues, mesdames dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'm particularly happy to welcome you this evening for the spring opening lecture to mark the beginning of our spring semester. This tradition is 10 years old and is now part of our yearly calendar. It's a unique opportunity to reinforce our links with society and strengthen the links within our own university community. More than ever in this pandemic, we need to maintain a sense of ritual. Of course, we would all have liked to have been here in person, as was the case in previous years, where this auditorium was full. But it's an opportunity for us to remind you that our calling as a university is to be a place of contact, a place of encounters, and it will never be replaced by purely virtual events. We hope that the semester that is starting here today will help us out of the tunnel that we have been forced into for too long now. We hope that after the Easter holidays, our university will progressively come back to normal and I already look forward to seeing all of you again in our auditoriums. What we have lost in personal contact over the past few months, we have managed to maintain in terms of impact by organizing events such as the one we have organized this evening. It will be an opportunity for those of you who do not yet know our lecturer to get to know Professor Dorothée borman poli who in a few moments will show us her great talent and vision, a vision that she is developing within our university. This is an important turning point for teaching and research in business schools around the world, and it makes our university a pioneer in Europe. Dorothy bauman pauli received a PhD in economics from the University of Zurich in 2010 while working for the Fair Labor Association. Then in 2013, she became research director at the NYU Stern Center for Business and Human Rights. And since 2019, she has been the director of our brand new Geneva Center for Business and Human Rights. As a specialist of business ethics and based on her extensive experience of the implementation of human rights in business, so she has published many articles and books on corporate social responsibility and human rights. Over the past 10 years, she has taught both in the United States and in Europe and has given lectures on many subjects related to human rights. This semester, she will be teaching business and human rights, and it is part of our graduate program. It has already attracted over 150 students. In this lecture, she will be putting forward a theory. She will be telling us that this current crisis is a unique opportunity to develop sustainable approaches to business and business models with human rights at their heart. This is a health crisis, which, of course, is leading to a broad international economic crisis. And the consequences for workers, especially those living in, in, in developing countries who do not have any social protection, can be disastrous. The World Bank has, in fact, stated that because of this crisis, over 100 million people may be pushed into extreme poverty. This is also an opportunity for us to rethink the current world economic structure. Many initiatives, such as the Dream and Just Recovery, have already been launched by structures such as the United Nations. Companies can rethink their supply chains in a more resilient and sustainable manner. Companies that are up to this will have a better long-term view rather than seeing human rights and the environment as an opposition to their business activities. They will see it as something that can contribute to their business. Before I give the floor to our lecturer, I have to tell you that there is 
uh, way of asking any questions that you may have. You can use uh, the chat function and a moderator, who I'd like to sincerely thank, um, is Miret Zaki. I wish you all a very fruitful lecture and enjoy the rest of your semester for those of you who are studying in our university. Thank you, Rector Flückinger, for your kind introduction and for inviting me to deliver the spring opening lecture. I'm very honored to be here today, and I look forward to sharing some insights and thoughts from our work at the Geneva Center for Business and Human Rights. Like most events in the past year, this event is taking place under special conditions. Usually, this large auditorium is full of students, colleagues, and members of the interested public who come together to celebrate the start of the new semester with us. It's fantastic that technology enables us to exchange knowledge and ideas, even during a pandemic that forces us to stay apart. I warmly welcome all of you who are joining us online today, and I'm grateful for your time and interest. My topic, business and human rights, often raises eyebrows because to many it sounds like an oxymoron. Business and human rights, aren't these entirely incompatible concepts? Typically, I can see the skepticism written all over the faces of people in the audience. Not today, but I look forward to addressing whatever raises your eyebrows in the Q&A session following my talk. So please engage with me and use the chat function to send questions throughout the event to my dear colleague, Mirit Zaki. My field of business and human rights is an emerging field in both academia and practice, but it is a field driven by practical and increasingly pressing needs of business. In a global economy, human rights-related challenges in business are everywhere. But surprisingly, they are often not very well understood. I'd even go as far as to say that human rights challenges are amongst the most complex business challenges for corporations today. From conversations with senior executives, I know that these are the issues that keep them up at night. The title of today's talk promises a challenge, the challenge of integrating human rights and business. To illustrate business and human rights challenges in different industry contexts, I invite you to think through a couple of scenarios with me. The first example relates to all the electronic devices that you're using right now to connect to this lecture, your phones, tablets, and computers. The lithium iron batteries that power these devices contain cobalt, an essential battery mineral that most probably originates from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Currently, more than two-thirds of the world's cobalt is sourced from there. The situation of cobalt miners in the Congo is dire. Mining accidents happen frequently. Child labor is common. Corruption is rampant, and the mining communities often live in extreme poverty. In 2019, I visited Congolese mining sites in Kolvesi a city in the south of the Congo. Here you can see a picture that I took at one of these mining sites called Casulo. Miners use basic tools to dig tunnels to reach and extract the ore. My field research confirmed that while large mining concessions run by international companies provide minimal safety standards for their own stuff, these operations only provide few jobs for the local community. Large fractions of the population continue digging for cobalt in smaller, unregulated mining sites that are particularly dangerous. Some uh, have tunnel constructions that are up to 90 meters deep. These smaller sites still produce 15 to 30 percent of the Congolese cobalt, and these sites ensure the livelihood for millions of Congolese. You can find more details of our analysis in this WEF white paper. The current onset of the e-vehicle boom is further driving up the demand for cobalt from the Congo. The British government recently announced to ban petrol and diesel engine cars by 2040. Other European countries have similar plans. And so some car companies already reacted and announced that they will transition. Just last week, for example, General Motors and Jaguar announced an all-electric future. On average, an electric car contains eight kilograms of cobalt. This is a massive amount compared to the tiny quantities in your phones or computers. So imagine 
You are a senior manager of a major car manufacturer. How would you handle the fact that to secure your company's future, you have no other choice but to source cobalt from the Congo? Environmentally conscious consumers are typically also sensitive to human rights issues. And if you, as the senior manager of a car company, want to build a long-term sustainable business strategy, you cannot ignore these severe human rights risks in the cobalt supply chain. But how do you actively engage in solving the human rights issues in small cobalt mines in the Congo? In the second example, I'm taking you to Bangladesh. After Rana Plaza, the tragic building collapse that killed over 11,000 workers in 2013, fashion brands came together and created multi-stakeholder organizations based on common industry standards that address workplace safety issues. The brands conducted thousands of safety inspections, and based on these, they drafted corrective action plans. It's been almost eight years since fashion brands have been working on establishing workplace safety in Bangladesh's garment industry, but their efforts focused mainly on their direct suppliers, suppliers that have a contractual relationship with the brand. To meet the production targets set out in contracts with fashion brands, these direct suppliers often work with their own network of local production facilities. They subcontract to handle the production pressures that come with low prices and short lead times demanded by fast fashion brands. I visited the Rana Plaza site in 2014 on the first anniversary of the tragedy. I took this picture while standing on the rubbles of the collapsed Rana Plaza building with my NYU colleagues. You can see that pieces of garments are still all over. Many of the workers that were killed that day worked for garment factories that produce for international fashion brands. Between 2014 and 2018, we published three reports on Bangladesh's garment industry. We mapped the industry and we found that subcontracting is the norm in the Bangladeshi garment industry, not the exception. Subcontracting is indeed a rational business strategy for suppliers to meet ever shorter delivery times and carve out marginal profits. This is how suppliers get the job done for fast fashion brands. But it also pushes human rights risks into deeper layers of the supply chain where brands have no oversight. From our research, it's clear that subcontracting is just a symptom of root causes that are embedded in the way how brands organize their business with suppliers. Their transactional relationship is expressed in so-called purchasing practices, practices that currently give a lot of flexibility to brands and often offer little or no support to suppliers. The negative impacts of this business model became blatantly obvious at the onset of the pandemic. As high street shops in the US and Europe closed, some brands and retailers immediately evoked the force majeure clause of their contracts and canceled orders and refused to pay suppliers, even for orders that had already gone into production. As a result, suppliers and workers, as the weakest link in this global supply chain, were hit the hardest with many businesses closing down and workers going hungry. As long as this transactional business model drives systemic human rights issues and continues to set incentives for subcontracting, then improving safety standards at direct suppliers alone will just be a band-aid. This approach will not create the safe and sustainable garment industry that France promised after Rana Plaza. Instead, we need to understand how current business models in the fashion industry affect human rights, and we need to make sure that respect for human rights becomes an integral part of business operations. This requires changing business as usual. In the context of the garment industry, this means developing alternative purchasing practices. And this ch is challenging because purchasing practices are at the heart of how companies make their money. So at this point, you may ask, isn't it the role of national governments to protect human rights? This is clearly what we expect here in Switzerland and in general in any democratic state. On this world map, you can see the 2020 results of the Economist Intelligence Unit's Democracy Index. It shows democracy had a very bad year. Only 8.4% of the world's population 
live in a full democracy, a democracy that is built on the rule of law and human rights. This makes clear that relying on governments alone to enforce human rights standards is not possible, and it puts the spotlight on corporations as key players in a globalized economy. To many companies, assuming an active role in promoting human rights still sounds overwhelming, but let me share some of my optimism. I think addressing human rights is feasible and desirable for business. To explain this, I'm going to make three arguments. First, implementing human rights in business operations is no longer optional, but critical for business success. Second, integrating human rights in business is possible, and the timing to work on this integration has never been more favorable. And third, business school education plays a critical role for advancing human rights in corporate practice. To the first argument, that implementing human rights in business operations is no longer optional, but critical for business success. The realization that human rights issues can negatively affect business kicked in more than three decades ago. In the early 1990s, it was the sportswear brand Nike that made headlines for poor working conditions and child labor in Southeast Asian footwear factories. Here's just one of many articles that depicted Nike as the poster child for irresponsible outsourcing. The Asian factories were not owned by Nike. Production was just contracted to these sites. Yet in the media, it was Nike that was made responsible for poor working conditions and child labor. The Nike case was one of the first major exposés of a Western company involved in human rights issues through its global manufacturing supply chain in jurisdictions that were not enforcing basic labor standards. The case triggered fundamental discussions about the role and responsibilities of companies for human rights. Some of these discussions continue today, but they have evolved substantially, particularly in the last decade and arguably most dramatically in the past 12 months. Let me mention two historic milestones. 73 years ago, member states of the United Nations signed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a document that enshrines fundamental rights and freedoms for all humans. To uphold these, the preamble of the Universal Declaration for Human Rights asks all organs of society to promote respect for these rights and freedoms. This, of course, also implies a role for corporations. In 2011, the role of corporations for human rights was made fully explicit with the unanimous endorsement of the UN Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights by the UN Human Rights Council. The UN Guiding Principles ask companies to prevent human rights abuses in company operations and provide remedies if such abuses take place. And this year, 2021, marks the 10th anniversary of the UN Guiding Principles. It's the year the UN calls the beginning of a decade of action, an invitation to move from conceptual to practical human rights solutions for business. Today, corporate leaders recognize that the question is no longer whether their companies have a role to play for human rights, but they need to know how to do it. And as so often, the implementation is the tricky part. But some companies address the issue head on. One large company that already 10 years ago reoriented its business towards creating long-term social impact is Unilever. Unilever launched its sustainable living plan in 2010. This plan outlines a strategy that decouples business growth from its environmental footprint while increasing its social impact. 10 years ago, this was a radical idea, but today it has been copied by many other companies, particularly in the form of climate pledges, like net zero carbon emissions. The strategy is based on the conviction that without healthy societies, there are also no healthy businesses. Paul Paulman, the former CEO of Unilever, famously said, I don't think our fiduciary duty is to put shareholders first. I say the opposite. What we firmly believe is that if we focus our company on improving the lives of the world's citizens and come up with genuine, sustainable solutions, we are more in sync with consumers and society and ultimately, this will result in good shareholder returns. With this framing of the purpose of the corporation, 
integrating human rights becomes a solvable management challenge. At the beginning of this year, Unilever doubled down on its commitment to advance its social impact. It announced that by 2030, it will refuse to do business with any firm that does not pay a living wage. This means a wage that covers a family's basic needs and helps them to break the cycle of poverty. This level of commitment is unusual for a large company like Unilever. But the new CEO, Alan Jobs, says it's simply good business. He believes that the desire of customers to buy products with good credentials has only increased during the pandemic. This is a good transition to my second argument, namely that the timing to work on integrating human rights in business has never been better. So this may be surprising. After all, the global health crisis also is an economic crisis, and the World Bank estimates that over 100 million people could slip into extreme poverty in 2021. Also, many companies are currently struggling. However, the pandemic has also brought to the surface unprecedented reflections about our current global economic system. The World Economic Forum is discussing the Great Reset. Several UN organizations have called for building forward better and a green and just recovery from the pandemic. These organizations challenge the status quo and encourage us to develop new business models and establish a new normal with human rights at the core. These intellectual debates are coupled with current developments that already affect corporations today. Let me mention three. First, investors. They are key drivers for human rights in business because of their fast-growing interest in so-called ESG data. ESG stands for Environment, Social, Governance, and refers to the three central factors for measuring sustainability and social impact of an investment in a business. As you can see here, the value of global assets applying environmental, social, and governance data to drive investment decisions has almost doubled over four years and more than tripled over eight years to $40.5 trillion in 2020. Investors are increasingly applying these non-financial factors to better determine the future financial performance of companies. In work with my colleagues at NYU, we have pointed out that investors are still far from defining good metrics to measure the S in ESG, the social dimension of sustainability that relates to human rights. However, the general interest of investors in these aspects of the business can set powerful incentives for companies to measure and report social and environmental business impacts and align their business models. The second development refers to the emerging legal framework for business and human rights. In Europe, the passing of laws that regulate the business conduct in relation to human rights has picked up remarkable speed in the past years. And to mention just a couple, since 2017, the Loi de Vigilance in France asks companies to conduct so-called human rights due diligence. In Germany, the coalition government just agreed earlier this month on a similar regulation, the supply chain law. This legislative trend will continue. The European Union has very ambitious plans to hold corporations legally accountable for their human rights impact. And companies that anticipate this le these legislative developments will have more time to transition, and that can give them a competitive advantage. In Switzerland, as many of you know, business and human rights was a hot topic last November when Swiss citizens voted on the Responsible Business Initiative. The initiative won the popular vote, but was rejected by a majority of the cantons. Yet the message for companies is clear. Swiss citizens demand that corporations respect human rights. This brings me to the third relevant development, namely public expectations that go beyond what's currently legally required. For companies, such expectations are just as relevant or even more relevant than legal requirements. A recent example that illustrates this is the experience that mining giant Rio Tinto made last year after destroying 46,000-year-old Aboriginal caves in Western Australia during an iron ore exploration. On this picture, you can see the site before and after the exploration. While this exploration was perfectly legal, the destruction of these unique 
indigenous sites caused a backlash from shareholders and the public. As a result, several senior figures at the company, including, including the CEO, had to resign. Replacing a senior management team and the CEO is costly for companies, and the public outcry was harmful for Rio Tinto's reputation. The company has now repeatedly apologized for the incident and is currently working with indigenous groups to progress a remedy. Still, the case raises questions about the company's social license to operate, and it demonstrates that following the law by the letter is not enough anymore. Future leaders need to be better prepared and also anticipate and manage the broader societal impacts of business decisions if they want to lead successful businesses. Taken together, these developments facilitate what some call the business case for human rights. They show that respecting human rights is not only a moral obligation, but increasingly makes good business sense. And by the business case, I don't mean to narrowly refer to the immediate bottom line. Instead, I think of the general robustness and the sustainability of business operations in the long run. One could say the world is moving in a direction that makes the integration of human rights a critical success factor for business sustainability. What we need to focus on now is the development of new business models that have respect for human rights built into core business operations. And in some sectors, we begin to see such solutions. Let me tell you about an alternative business model that is currently emerging in the context of the garment sector. From my earlier scenario of garment companies in Bangladesh, you already know that companies, even the best intentioned ones, are often not using the right tools to address systemic human rights issues. In our field research, we found that purchasing practices the way how brands organize their sourcing can make all the difference. In Ethiopia, we analyzed alternative purchases, purchasing practices of Decathlon, a French sporting goods manufacturer and retailer. In contrast to the price-focused transactional business models of many fashion brands, Decathlon carefully selects their suppliers and commits to working with them longer term, at least five years, ideally longer. Together, they draft joint business plans and they become production partners. This partnership approach has many advantages for the brand, the supplier, and the worker. For the brand, a closer collaboration with the supplier allows to improve production methods and product quality over time. There's also greater flexibility to discuss order changes and to directly oversee compliance with labor standards. For the supplier, the partnership model offers planning stability. This allows the supplier to invest in its business while profiting from the management expertise of the brand. And workers benefit from Decathlon's investment in training. Decathlon considers upskilling the workforce as key for increasing productivity levels that in turn can support rising wages. And higher wages are desperately needed in Ethiopia where workers cannot survive on a base wage level of as low as $26 per month. On this slide, you can see me in the recruitment center of Havasa Park, an industrial site in the south of the country. I'm busy doing an aptitude test to better understand the skills that manufacturers require from new garment workers. Decathlon's purchasing practices show that the outsourcing of production does not have to imply the outsourcing of responsibility. Their longer-term sourcing commitments give the implementation of human rights at least a chance. In Ethiopia, the factories that Decathlon works with have much lower worker turnover rates, an indication that workers are more content with their working conditions than elsewhere. Decathlon is currently rolling out their partnership business model in many other sourcing destinations because this model is not only profitable, but also enables human rights principles and profits to coexist. To better understand what else a list of good purchasing practices should entail, we need to conduct further empirical studies, also studies that analyze the longer term impacts on workers and communities. The objective of analyzing these individual companies and publishing case studies is not to show perfect solutions, but to learn from what works in practice,
to build on these experiences and to identify new business strategies, not only for individual companies, but for an entire industry. I also use the Decathlon case study in my teaching. So if you signed up for my business human rights class, you will learn more. And I do this to inspire the next generation of leaders. And this brings me to my last argument. In this final part, I want to explore the role of business school education for supporting companies in the implementation of human rights. I argue that business schools play a critical role for advancing human rights in practice. To make human rights a business reality, we need to work on three levels. Short term, businesses need to respond to human rights issues as they emerge. Medium term, Businesses need to develop and transition to sustainable business models that have human rights at the core. And long term, we need to bring these insights from practice into education and advance them through research and teaching to train the next generation of leaders. And this is, of course, where business schools such as the Geneva Center for Economics and Management come in. These are the institutions where many future business leaders are passing through. During their education, we can develop their vision for sustainable business, and we can also give them the tools to implement this vision. Students are very keen to learn about sustainable business solutions. Business is often seen as part of the problem um, for societal challenges such as climate change or global inequality. But students today want to be part of the solution. You may have seen that in France, students even protested because they felt their schools did not have adequate course offerings that address sustainability topics. Business school students also increasingly look for fields that allow them to align their career goals with their personal values. For a long time, business graduates wanted to work on Wall Street. Now many want to do startups and become social entrepreneurs. This shows that as the world is changing, business school education also needs to adapt to remain relevant. Ah, that didn't work. Our Geneva Center for Business and Human Rights is part of the Geneva School for Economics and Management at the University of Geneva. We are currently the first human rights center at a business school in Europe we're closely allied with the NYU Stern Center for Business and Human Rights, where I spent half of my time. And together, we're pioneering the institutionalization of the business and human rights field in business education. We have created momentum for the integration of human rights in business education, but we cannot create a movement without the help of many others. And this is why in 2017, we founded a network of business schools that work jointly on this human rights agenda. It's great to see that our group has grown to over 60 business schools and is creating excitement for a paradigm shift in business and management education. Together, we published a resource for all business schools around the world that want to embrace a human rights agenda. In this toolkit, we highlight teaching materials, research outlets, and relevant contacts at leading business schools. It's exciting to work on this project with my fantastic team here in Geneva. We are privileged to be at a university that is so strongly committed to advancing sustainable development. I'd like to thank Rector Flückinger and GSM's Dean Marcelo Olariaga for their visionary leadership that made it possible to launch our center in November 2019. To them, business and human rights was never an oxymoron. The premise of all our work at the Geneva Center for Business and Human Rights is that business can be a force for good. We stand ready to support companies in the development of sustainable business models that create value for business and society. These are unique times, also challenging times, but these times create unprecedented opportunities for businesses to innovate for sustainability. We should seize the moment and make sure to empower the next generation of business leaders to adopt and promote business and human rights as the new normal. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Thank you, uh, for this topic tonight. 
So I invite you, please, uh, the audience, to send us your questions. <laughs> Our iPad is waiting here, and Dorothy <laughs> is looking forward mm -hmm. to answer all of them. So yeah. we have a first question, Dorothy, which right. I'll right away share with mm -hmm. you. Um, the first question is, do you think that growth in sustainable investments is more of a trend or more of a real concern for companies? Mm -hmm. Does it depend of, on the company's activity? Mm -hmm. So I think it's more than a trend. It's really a reflection of our times. But as I mentioned, we're still far from defining good metrics that could truly capture human rights performance of companies. So the ESG data that I mentioned, environmental social governments data, the strongest portions are on the E, the environmental part, and some good metrics for governance as well. But the S metrics are under-delivered and not very well-defined at this point. So we need to do better and help investors to truly assess human rights performance through exactly. ESG. That was also mm -hmm. my, my concern, is that uh, not only do, uh, does the investment industry use mm -hmm. this ESG mm -hmm. criteria, environmental, social, yeah. and uh, governance criteria, yeah. but also companies mm -hmm. use the CSR, corporate social responsibility, mm -hmm. Uh, and environmental responsibility, and, and it stops there, and it's already mm -hmm. difficult for them to implement. And mm -hmm. it seems that the human rights factor is quite foreign to them, actually. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go much beyond what is the, the, the United Nations circle. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you believe that companies and mm -hmm. investors should extend, really, their mm -hmm. notion of, of social responsibility to include human rights, because human rights is, is a totally other uh, <laughs> issue that, was, yeah. uh, that has always been the concern of governments, yeah. but not of companies. And clearly that is changing now. So I think for decades, sustainability has just been green. Yeah. But this is changing now with the realization, and I must say this pandemic has helped in that uh, sense to show that environmental concerns are also social concerns and those two dimensions are actually just two sides of the same coin and it's maybe harder for companies to understand human rights but as i said we stand ready to support them in understanding how they can align respect for human rights with um, their business okay we have uh, other questions what do you think of the which concrete references are available at the EU Commission level? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's a very specific question. <laughs> uh, well. Mm -hmm. Sorry, because I'm, I'm getting changes in, in the questions, <laughs> but uh, we need to take them one after the other. So, um, yeah. No Someone worries. Asked, do you I, know, I, I do think you, for the legal development yes. of human rights accountability, the European level will be decisive. They have very ambitious plans, and mm -hmm. uh, France already has a law. Germany agreed to um, create one. Um, so in the Netherlands the, as well. Netherlands. Yes, there's doing? a child labor act in the Netherlands. It's happening all around Europe right now. So mandatory human rights due diligence is really becoming the norm, and at the European level they really want to pick this up um, at a very ambitious level. Mm -hmm. So companies that operate in Europe, they need to pay attention but to these what developments. What's your answer to critics who say mm -hmm. that uh, the European level enforcement will be really uh, effective within five years at mm -hmm. best? Sure. And they are not even sure that it will ever happen, actually. Do you think that the EU will really move forward and do it and, well. and enforce it and make it mandatory? Yes, I believe so, but as I also pointed out, following the law by the letter is just not a good enough anymore for companies that want to be successful tomorrow. So anticipating these legislative trends, but also understanding what public expectations are around human rights, I think this is what forward-looking business leaders are doing. And then the actual law is just one data point in their ecosystem. They will look at multiple developments, including investors, including public expectation, and legal developments and other things mm -hmm. that all point in the same direction, that engaging in human rights issues makes good business sense. Mm -hmm. The next is, how do you <laughs> interpret the fact that in Switzerland, mm -hmm. the economic sector has been very critical of mm -hmm. the initiative mm. on uh, responsible multinationals? Yes, sure. So, 
uh, I actually, it was a very polarized debate leading up to this um, vote in November, and I watched some of these debates live, and um, it was more a discussion over the means than over the actual objective. Opponents and advocates actually agreed on the objective that human rights matter for business. So, so. what would it take for the Swiss economy, mm -hmm. some cantons that were mm -hmm. opposed, to accept the idea and move forward? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what changes should be done to an initiative to, for it mm -hmm. to pass here? Mm -hmm. So clearly they had problems with the civil liability and the death in, uh, of uh, supply chain reach of the activities. Um, for me, this legal component is, again, just one data point. I believe that companies more carefully actually look at what happens in the world around them, what do others expect from me, and then they navigate these expectations. Some are legal, some are non-legal. So, I'm not sure if the legal accomplishment um, will be the silver bullet for everything, but co forward-looking companies are already embracing a human rights Does agenda. Does the Swiss government have a role to play in, in order to promote the business and human rights values? Absolutely. Um, again, I think change needs to come from multiple sources. There's a role for governments, there's a role for media, NGOs, also academia, clearly. Um, and companies themselves. And the Swiss government has been very active in supporting business and human rights. They also mm -hmm. have a national action plan where they, for example, clearly say that our Geneva Center for Business and Human Rights is a key element in their strategy to advance okay. human rights and practice. Mm, that's a great point. Uh, mm. Now we have a clever question here. How concerned should you be that companies will cut back on employment mm -hmm. uh, if uh, they have to, uh, they are forced to comply with human rights? So they could uh, say mm -hmm. we, we, our margin were squeezed, mm -hmm. is squeezed and we're cutting back, we're cutting uh, jobs, so. Um. I do believe that in the short term, engaging in human rights may cost some money, but it is what it takes to create a sustainable business model in the long term. And so the jobs, um, to secure the jobs long term, this is what it takes to make some initial investments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean that jobs will get lost. They may change, but they don't necessarily get lost. Thank you. <laughs> now, uh, what do you think of the Great Reset proposal of Klaus Schwab is one of the questions, <laughs> but you mentioned it. Yes, I mentioned uh, it. Yeah. How does it fit with your own uh, mm -hmm. studies and, and works? Yeah. So as I said, there's really movement on the intellectual level to rethink the global economy we live in. And the World Economic Forum terms it as the Great Reset that we need. Right now, this is just, these are just words. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to put that into action, just like stakeholder capitalism, another concept that Klaus Schwab has put forward. So now we need to work to put this into action, and I'm happy to help from the academic side and the Geneva Center for Business and Human Rights to think through actual practical solutions for these ambitious goals. Well, I read The Great Reset, and it, what okay. it actually really stresses yeah. is the threat of automation mm -hmm. and robotization. Mm -hmm. So could, it, could the solution, the cynical solution, come mm. from robotizing everything and not needing mm. to respect any human rights anywhere mm. in, on the planet? Eventually this will come, but we're still in a longer transition period. And you know, while wages and, uh, are so low in developing countries, I even don't think that automation will come to the garment industry in the next 10, 15, 20 years. So during this transition period, we still need to figure out how to make sure that outsourcing of production actually helps a fair globalization and leads to socioeconomic development in those developing countries so that they can also advance, so that they can probably move on from the garment industry to other industries and diversify their industries. China mm -hmm. has done it. They mm -hmm. started out with a heavy focus on manufacturing now they've moved on to many other sectors. Mm -hmm. uh, someone is asking what you think of the B Corp label, the B Corp that some uh, yes. companies and banks here have. Yeah, it's a certification, a benefit corporation. Um, I find this, is, uh, again, a commendable effort. 
it's a certification in my field for human rights, I believe that the job is never done. So mm -hmm. the methodology of certification and working on human rights, there's a contrast in that mm -hmm. you can never, at no point in time, tick it off and say we've done it. Um, but uh, clearly these are companies that are committed to a way of doing business in a principled way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, someone says, how can we avoid the companies only thinking about how the public will perceive them and react to their mm -hmm. activities instead of actually committing mm -hmm. to uh, sustainable development? It, it yep. always seems like they're, they're uh, caring about yeah. marketing and, mm -hmm. and their yeah. image. Yeah, indeed. I mean, these are then the companies that are true leaders. And I mentioned Unilever that already long before this time committed to their sustainable living plan and uh, I worked for a company in, in Germany like almost 20 years ago, Puma, a sportswear company, and the CEO at the time said, well, right now our, our consumers don't appreciate our efforts in sustainability, but we only want to produce sustainable products. So what do we need to do? We need to focus our marketing on creating the sustainable consumer, a consumer that appreciates our work on sustainability. Mm -hmm. So this, of course, then is true leadership. So you educate the consumer yes. to appreciate yes. your efforts in sustainability. To then buy your products, yeah, also exactly. for that reason. <laughs> Interesting. No. Um, you are asked, why didn't you use the word compliance? No. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's true that in yeah. business we say compliance mm -hmm. with, uh, with the rules. So Yes, compliance so they is... they comply uh, with human rights? It's, a, know, it's a very legal concept. Yeah. Um, so again, I think business and human rights goes further. It goes beyond following the law by the letter. We're on the, the level of principles. Yes, know. and that's actually also a threat for all the legal developments in this field right now, that it may then reduce business and human rights and the opportunities it brings for business to a purely legal exercise, and it will then be dealt with by corporate lawyers mm -hmm. in companies. Mm -hmm. And instead, it should be dealt with by supply chain managers or people in operations that can then make sure that they use the business opportunities that this engagement creates. Okay, and what kind of sanctions uh, should states impose on companies that do not respect human rights? Uh, in Switzerland, mm -hmm. the, the, it was mentioned that there could be sanctions. Uh, that uh, the, the economic sector didn't like. So yeah. people are asking you, what, how, what is mm. the mechanism that could sanction mm. the non-respect of, of Yeah, the sanctions, I, I find they are a very crude tool. So I don't think that helps business. I'd rather create platforms where representatives of governments and business and civil society can figure out, figure out the best solutions to a given problem rather than a crude sanction scheme. Um, so how do you believe mm -hmm. we, what can be a substitute to sanctions? I mean, what can be, mm -hmm. would, would it be incentives rather than sanctions? I think it depends like the on carrots? the situation. Very often, I think business remaining or leaving business in certain difficult situations actually opens doors to influence situations. Withdrawal of business and sanctioning business closes those doors. Mm -hmm. And that's not what we want. We want business as a gateway to engaging, to making sure that other governments play by the rules. That means really educating people from this A to Z in, in the human rights issue. So someone is asking, mm. how do you think that uh, doing the new master in responsible management and human rights can help students? What type okay. of career path mm -hmm. is then open to graduates? So oh, I'm very happy about this question um, because it's something I didn't mention in my talk, mm -hmm. but I'm really proud that here at the Geneva School for Economics and Management, we're launching mm -hmm. this fall the Master in Responsible Management, and mm -hmm. in this master you actually have the option to specialize in sustainable business and human rights, which I believe is still unique. Mm -hmm. um, and what you get from this is a robust management education with a focus on these sustainability themes, and it opens career options in business, I would hope. This is not a specialization that would then make you perfect for a UN job. You might mm -hmm. also be perfect for a UN job afterwards, but the goal is to train you to become the next business, business leader, leader that truly embraces sustainability and human rights. 
Excellent. Uh, so business leaders that are trained yes. to this concern yeah. and are not indifferent to it. So uh, another question, the young generation often find itself powerless compared to mm. big companies and their unlawful actions. Would you advocate for stronger reactions from the young people, the youth? Should the, yes. the youth be more into advocacy, mm. militancy? <laughs> So this is probably the number one question that I get in my classes. Mm -hmm. What can we do yeah. as consumers, as students? And as students, uh, I find it interesting that in France, students are now pro protesting. They actually want to be trained on sustainable business solutions. They want course offerings that bring in themes that they read about in the newspapers. From global inequality to Black Lives Matter, how does this affect business or gender inequality and pay gaps mm -hmm. and how can these topics become part of business school education? Mm -hmm. um, this is what business schools need to figure out to stay relevant. To discuss these issues yeah. in class, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. S someone says that maybe massive corruption at institutional and commercial level should be tackled because semi-failed or failed states are not doing what they should be doing, obviously. Yes. Um, I mean, I showed the world map of the um, Economist Intelligence Unit for the mm -hmm. very reason to show that, unfortunately, we don't live in an ideal world. Ideally, mm -hmm. governments protect human rights, but this is just not the world we live in. Mm -hmm. And, of course, many companies do a poor job in protecting human rights and sometimes governments are also part of the problem. Mm -hmm. There are high levels of corruption. Yes. And then how can companies in such contexts do good business? Mm -hmm. That's the question. Yeah. 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 So someone is asking, uh, they, he has a... So many questions. Yes, it's wonderful, <laughs> yeah, by the way. Thank great. you so much. <laughs> yes. So uh, if someone has a background in uh, human rights and uh, public admin and has done internships in CSR in New York, in Vietnam, how can he get involved in your current work and mm -hmm. help the, the same work mm -hmm. that you, I mean, the same efforts you're, you're in, involved in? Yeah, so that's another question I frequently get after students have taken my classes. How can I make a career out of this? And right, exactly. there's no linear paths, I would say. Um, there are more jobs now, um, yet I would say the classes that I teach are really for future leaders, so not necessarily for your first job that you have after graduation but in your I junior position. But if I want to go position. and maybe, if I want to go investigate those mm -hmm. fields oh. in, in different countries mm -hmm. and, and check what's happening there, is mm -hmm. it uh, some young people could do this, for instance? Yes, of course, they could join NGOs, they do investigative work, they could join media organizations, or they could stay in academia, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, or they could also work for governments. Um, European government. You yourself go on the field and you explore I do. what's happening yes, in the mines. I, and the I really see yeah. uh, the value of seeing with my own eyes. So, um, why isn't it part on. of the studies here going there? And, and is it dangerous? Is it maybe. I'd love to take students. And at NYU Stern, we've actually done this. We've taken students um, to Kenya to help mm -hmm. develop a business model for a smaller business there, together with students. That was fantastic. I'd love to do this here as well. But yeah. of course, the organization is uh, not so easy. Um, and my trip to the Congo, for example, also was complicated and also dangerous. So I would not necessarily feel comfortable bringing a group of students there. We're not right talking now. about tourism here, yeah. huh? exactly. <laughs> but I think they'll never forget it yeah. when they see it. So, no, of um, course, this would be the most impressive way of teaching students to actually bring them to the sites and ask them to support business solutions that they observe there. Mm -hmm. Okay, the question here is that the core activity of mining companies is mm -hmm. to exploit resources. Mm -hmm. How those companies can act to respect the environment and human rights? Mm -hmm. Isn't it mm -hmm. uh, antinomic? Uh, the oxymoron. <laughs> yes. Um, no, not necessarily, because also mining companies have really advanced um, in their understanding how to bring in human rights. And uh, the example that I gave was a particularly bad one of Rio Tinto, in, uh, destroying these indigenous, unique indigenous sites. Mm -hmm. um, but of course what they should have done is before making such a business decision, they could have engaged with key stakeholders, including Aboriginal communities, to understand their perspective and their point of view. 
it would have been more relevant than looking up what's legal <laughs> so right. in that context. So. Well, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. extracting is extracting. I mean, it is mm. uh, something that can't be much uh, good to the environment. Well, that's a point they make here is true. Right. You're, you're suggesting that mining per se can never be sustainable, and I, I disagree with that because um, I see in the Congolese context that mining can, could also be a path for socioeconomic development of currently extremely poor mining communities. You said if they done right, millions, right? Yes, if done right, I think the outsourcing of production um, is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. The globalized economy, after all, has lifted many, many people out of extreme mm -hmm. poverty. Mm -hmm. So I believe in the f that business can be a force for good, mm -hmm. but it has to be done right. And that's why we need to look carefully at the business models that often drive systemic human rights issues in global supply chains. That includes mining. Mm -hmm. I think also in the mining context, explorations can be done in a way that is a lot more responsible. Than yes, so there is lots of margin for improvement, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, some are asking, so how, how long should we wait for a new global model to emerge? Because there is a mm -hmm. gap between awareness and the will to change things. And you yes. told me that in an interview yeah. uh, early, a few months before, yeah. is that yeah. there is lots of words, but the, the mm -hmm. will really to change, to sac maybe sacrifice some profits and margin is really yeah. difficult. And let's be honest and admit mm -hmm. that... Uh, it isn't as profitable to uh, mine for the, the uh, workers, the ethics, the environment. It isn't as, you, you can't really maximize your mm. margin this way, right? Maybe not maximize, but be profitable in the long run. So it depends on your time horizon. Yes. So short term, you may have to make additional investments, but this means you can't just be successful much longer. So this is where I think a, a business case, you know, might play out. And, but you said that, yeah, right now there uh, should be made for the Big Bang. I don't think this will ever come. There will be incremental progress. And right mm -hmm. now we are at mm -hmm. crossroads and at an interesting point in time mm -hmm. where I believe we can maybe make faster progress um, than ever before. And we should mm -hmm. really seize this moment. Mm -hmm. So, um, but Decathlon, for instance, they're, mm -hmm. they're still in Ethiopia. I mean, yes. Ethiopia is where you get the cheapest salaries, after mm -hmm. all. It's still four yes. times cheaper than, than Bangladesh, which is already extremely cheap. So yes. they are all, uh, be it H&M, uh, H &M, mm. Yes, and Calvin Klein, mm. they're having workers with $23 mm -hmm. uh, as a yeah. salary. Uh, so, I mean, so far, up to this day, mm. we've been uh, racing to the cheapest of countries mm. to produce, you know? So the Ethiopia decision was actually not only based on low wages. I think they played a major role, but, you know, for these business decisions, they're complex, and a lot of things come together. Logistics matter, um, the availability of the workforce matters, the support of the government matters, and all these things look really favorable in the context of Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And taken together, it was considered the African country that could try a structural transformation from a society that mostly does agriculture to a society that industrializes. And mm -hmm. in a way, Ethiopia is also uh, an exploration of, is this possible in Africa? And um, starting... Um, with wages incredibly low, didn't mean that those wages should be locked in then. Instead, mm -hmm. the idea was we start low, which was actually, according to initial calculations, um, similar to the wage of a teacher, for example, in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. But now, of course, also the standard of living in Ethiopia has developed. Now the wages need to adjust, and whether they can adjust as quickly as they need to, that's the question. But the idea of going to Ethiopia is, I, I think, not problematic if the outsourcing is done in a way that gives those workers a chance to develop with rising wages and maybe equip them with skills that then allow them to work elsewhere. Right. So can we say that investors, when they do the ESG criteria, yeah. mm -hmm. the S mm -hmm. criteria that you mentioned, mm -hmm. the social one, yeah. could be linked to rising wages, adjusting wages, reasonable wages, you know? Yeah, so in, of 
in the garment context, I would love to see the S linked to purchasing practices, to the way how companies organize their sourcing. Mm -hmm. Is this a long-term model, or are they engaging in what I call a transactional business model, where they place orders and demand for very low prices and very low turnaround times without investing in the facilities that they work with? Mm -hmm. So for that, I felt, I, I think the decathlon model is innovative because it really focuses on creating a partnership, mm -hmm. a partnership where both partners can grow. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking at the several questions. There are mm -hmm. many that are really trying to say, how can we make it happen, include human rights yeah. in companies? What should we do even at the level of the university? <laughs> <laughs> I would love I'm to sure. say join us I'm um, sure the university and work with that. us, um, yeah. because this is exactly our core mission, to develop right. those business models that mm -hmm. bring human rights into practice. Um, right. We want to make this practical. Well, we think it's feasible. Some would like to join the center. <laughs> okay. uh, a lot are concerned about greenwashing and blue washing. Mm. Okay. I don't know blue washing. That's Blue washing is uh, yeah. the um, use of the UN flag mm -hmm. to say that companies are doing great things, but it's just words. So to avoid greenwashing and bluewashing and whatever pretentious or symbolic activities that companies engage in to look better, I think what we need is concrete industry standards, industry standards that are measurable, there are metrics and key performance indicators to hold corporations to account. So right now we have a very high level commitment of many companies to respect human rights, but I'd actually like to track this commitment over time. And I can only do that if companies in the very same industry follow the same standards. So I think what we still need to do is to break down the high level commitment into industry specific standards that I can eventually measure. I mean, it's this old mm -hmm. business school mm -hmm. mantra, what measures gets so done. Mm -hmm. So we need to measure progress on human rights according to common industry standards right. so that I can eventually say whether Nike or Adidas is actually the better performer for human rights. Excellent. This is what we need to do now. For uh, analysts also for yes. the investing parameters. It would make system? transparent how Absolutely. well they're performing mm -hmm. on human rights. Some are saying that shortening the supply chains would help mm -hmm. align with uh, human rights, right? Um, indeed, that mm -hmm. certainly helps um, for a brand to have full transparency over their supply chain. It helps to reduce the complexity of the supply yeah. chain. And mm -hmm. for example, source directly from suppliers instead of uh, also using agents that then place mm -hmm. orders at multiple suppliers and then you lose the visibility in your supply chain and you cannot uh, well manage the risks. Mm -hmm. So simplifying yeah. the supply chain, this is what many companies have done. I think Nike mm -hmm. had over a thousand suppliers in the 90s and now they work with a few hundred because mm -hmm. they say they can only control and work closely with fewer suppliers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do you believe that after 10 years, the, the principles of the United Nations uh, relative to the companies and human rights yeah. have, uh, have been sort of a failure of soft law? Uh, they really mm. Uh, mm. never were binding. So, mm -hmm. uh, and, and others are saying, should we have a court in charge of controlling the business reports mm -hmm. relating to the impact of the activity on mm. HR? Mm. So uh, many are saying, how do you, we make it really effective binding. You believe in uh, business standards, but mm. many here believe mm -hmm. that maybe it wouldn't be enough and they would like mm. to imagine something yes. legal. I yes. mean, th they would like something mm. to be enforced. As so, I mentioned, the legal developments are underway, but I still see a necessity to complement those legal requirements with soft law initiatives because the industry expertise need, is needed to operationalize those industry standards that we need to make progress measurable. Mm -hmm. Law will always be high level, mm -hmm. but to break things down, I think will still require soft law initiatives mm -hmm. that then flesh out what is meant by the law mm -hmm. in specific industry contexts, because yeah. the human rights challenges, as you've seen here, are very different in different very contexts. Different, uh, yes. So for manufacturing, clearly there are labor rights issues in their mm -hmm. supply chains, but I mean, look at the um, social media companies. 
uh, the right to privacy, the right to freedom of expression are the key issues for Completely those Completely other industries. issues than in manufacturing. Yes, indeed. So some are, have uh, important questions about the, the point of competitiveness if mm -hmm. Europe uh, abides by those rules, mm -hmm. but not China, but maybe mm -hmm. not uh, the US. What do we do? Do mm -hmm. we lose competitiveness here, as, as we are already doing? Really, uh, <laughs> in fact, uh, Europe mm. is really losing ground. So. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, they want to sell their products here in these mm -hmm. markets. And so aligning the way of production with expectations here, I think, makes a lot of sense. And that also then brings along, I think, or has hopefully spillover effects to other facilities where production takes place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Workers start demanding it. So mm -hmm. workers from former Nike factories where mm -hmm. they've now experienced that the brand actually enforces a code of conduct, mm -hmm. if they go elsewhere, they will ask for the same rights. Right. So I hope that also at the production level there are spillover effects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how is the academia uh, acting in order to itself promotes the, those ideas. Mm -hmm. Can it be more activist? Um, mm -hmm. That's one of the questions. And uh, another was uh, related to that was uh, uh, that uh, business schools put CSR classes as site classes. <laughs> yes. Could it be more a core business also mm -hmm. at business schools since you said it's Indeed. Art, human rights should yeah. be core to right. companies? Shouldn't should it be core? In Absolutely. Education, so. It should be core at companies and core mm -hmm. at business school education. And CSR is really the old way of doing things at companies mm -hmm. because it means business as usual plus maybe social audits or training, etc. But business and human rights is different. It really embeds the idea of human rights in the core, in core business operations and hopefully in core business education as mm -hmm. well. And I'm proud that we here at the Geneva School for Economics and Management have brought responsible management into the core. It's one mm -hmm. of our core values of the mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. um, and this program is the master program. Mm -hmm. It's not that there's a master program and there's a responsible management master mm -hmm. program. It's all the same. It's the one master program on responsible management. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. So uh, we can end with two questions. First, do you consider environment as part of human rights? Mm -hmm. Yes, I guess um, you do. It's complex relationship. As I said, I believe these are two sides of the same coin. Um, if we destroy our planet, humans can't live here anymore. So clearly there's a close connection. In academia, this connection is currently being explored between climate change and uh, global inequality as sort of the two mega themes um, that we need to tackle in the years to come. But so there will be more much, cross But cut. are, are mm. companies making it too much of a priority, environment, I mean, uh, at the expense of the social issues. You seem to, to uh, say this. Earlier. No, I'm actually really happy when companies go all in on climate change um, okay. activities. Yes. But I think in parallel, they should also advance social mm -hmm. impact themes mm -hmm. because one doesn't go without the other. Mm -hmm. uh, is um, a compensation uh, process for families of minors in Congo and mm -hmm. other countries part of the... Mm -hmm. the trend to internalize the responsibilities to, to human rights at companies? Are they supposed to, to uh, give uh, some money to, to, to uh, indemnities to people? Suffered? No, I think the responsibility of companies is to ensure that the mining methods are safe, that those sites are safe, mm -hmm. and that workers or miners can work a decent mm -hmm. living through their mm -hmm. activity. Yes. Um, and that will then hopefully lead to an upward um, yes. spiral for also improved living conditions. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, do, to prevent rather than have to repair them. Okay, yeah. so uh, <laughs> questions keep coming. So Incredible. sorry if we just have a few minutes uh, Quite a wild delay, mix but for me. is <laughs> Nike responsible, uh, accountable mm -hmm. about the Uyghur case? Uh, Ooh. You, you that I believe is it. the hot issue for the years to come, whether yeah. and how to do business with China. Mm -hmm. um, the Fair Labor Association, a multi-stakeholder initiative with the mission to improve labor rights and global government supply chains, has actually um, deliberated over how to deal um, with 
the problem or the allegations of genocide against the Uyghur ethnic minority right now. And their conclusion was that sourcing from China where 80% of the cotton, the Chinese cotton, comes from that region is currently not possible. Okay. So unless there is transparency and the Chinese government allows for independent audits by those brands, they cannot have any assurance that they are not complicit in uh, human rights atrocities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Two last questions. I, say, I keep saying that, but this one should be right. <laughs> yeah. the, the last question would be mm -hmm. about students, but the okay. one before is about um, could your center develop a label mm -hmm. that would, um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, certify that mm -hmm. certain product was made in right conditions? Yes, that would be beautiful. But as you know, there are already many labels out there. There's almost a label jungle, and it becomes, it's, it's not so clear anymore what stands behind those labels. Mm -hmm. Labels also suggest, again, a bit like certification, that it, there's a point in time at which you are good enough to get the label, and it doesn't really encourage you to improve continuously and continue working on your social impact. So I'm not sure if a label is ideal, for um, my context, but of course okay. I understand the desire of consumers At a to, certain point, uh, to know, have indeed in easy time. visibility for mm -hmm. companies. Right now it's so complex and difficult for consumers because to company, make good decisions. Companies would feel responsibilized, you know, <laughs> they would feel yes. uh, scrutinized mm -hmm. by those labels, right? Yes. Maybe. Maybe yeah, a label maybe that says fairer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Someone says, I, I want this question, I want to ask you. Can so, I just, yes. um, just add on, to this? So. Generally, I don't want to separate out companies with label, without a label. The instead, I want the mainstream business to embrace a human rights agenda. So instead of uh, making visible some that try really hard, I want to bring mainstream business along and ensure yeah, that they follow industry standards that are measurable. It could provoke jealousy yeah. for the ones who a don't race have to the, the top. Lip, to want to have the lip, but that never mind. Someone is, is uh, ask, a philosophic one is asking, yeah. uh, should we lower our privileges mm -hmm. for more global equity, equality? You know, uh, to make this very the, practical, certainly our consumption levels are not sustainable. So. Mm -hmm. Um, cutting back on overconsumption mm -hmm. is certainly something that individuals can do to contribute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what is the role of students? Do they have a, or play a crucial role in this whole mm -hmm. issue? <laughs> Will we be the change of tomorrow, they, yes. say, they ask, yes. in companies regarding such issues? Mm -hmm. So this is the yes. question about the, the role that students listening to us should you know, what should they do in order to provoke? Maybe they are the solution, really. Yes, no, the, I teach here because I believe education is the solution to this. This is, as I mentioned, the place where future business leaders are passing through. This is where they develop their vision. This is where we can give them the tools to implement this vision. This is what motivates me in my teaching. And I think it's the task of students to demand such classes, to ask that sustainable business solutions are taught so that they can practice them safely in the classroom, not being thrown out in the business world where they have to face these issues. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, I hope this is inspiring to <laughs> you when you come to classes and follow uh, Dorothy, but also other classes and ask the right questions and, and follow the, the, the important topics. But a very last this time is, you see, look, I'm putting the iPad okay. here because there are no questions anymore. Okay. Really, many people have been asking about the Swiss initiative mm -hmm. and okay. uh, wondering why it didn't work, what mm -hmm. could make it work, did it have the right approach, can it come uh, back later on mm -hmm. with the, uh, yeah. different features and mm. the last word about this, maybe? Well, I hear uh, in those questions, I think there's disappointment that it didn't work out this time. For me, again, it was one data point in an ecosystem for corporations. Um, and there are many other data points that we can work on in the meantime. I'm certainly motivated to work on education. I'm also motivated to work in multi-stakeholder settings on developing those industry-specific standards. These are things that we can work on and that are needed anyway. 
um, and at a European level, a law may eventually come through. But for good business, I think the business reasons will be the main driver for doing this and for getting this right. I think your pragmatic approach is yeah. the one really because they need to be convinced yeah. and you also believe in, in working deep at the deep societal mm. level, at mm. the grassroots re level really to raise the whole society to, to believing in those principles. And uh, <laughs> Dorothy is really about uh, principles. Yes, I and I'm hoping got it. I'm right in that right. the world develops in a direction that makes integrating human rights critical for business success. And it could be part of the DNA of companies and of society, really. That, that yes. would be the, the start of it. Indeed. Wonderful. <laughs> thank you. And please keep on doing this. It's, it's very inspiring. Thank you, Mirad. And thanks, thank everyone thanks who sent University so many questions. Thank wonderful, you. really. They were very inspired. And yeah. the questions were in a great English, I guess, with many <laughs> anglophones. And so uh, good luck for the students. Uh, wonderful semester. Wonderful semester to you, Dorothy. Thank you to the University of Geneva for this excellent event. And uh, we hope to be following those activities uh, closely and reporting on them. Uh, have a nice evening, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Good everyone. Evening. Thank you.